Hi everyone, Don Gill is back with another fun fact. Hey, listen, we're going to walk through the refrigerant cycle today. It's going to be quick, fast, and hang on. Uh, uh, we're going to go through some very basic fundamental stuff the way I teach it. Uh, I'm not scripted, so it may be different today than it is tomorrow, but you'll get the gist of it, okay? I want to start out by saying this. We've got, uh, we've got, let me get a laser here. We've got four basic components in a DX system. It doesn't matter how large the system is or how small it could be then the dashboard of your car or, or the most complex system you can think of on the DX system. And those things are what? Our metering device, we've got an evaporator coil, we have a compressor, and we have a condenser. And we're going to walk through all these and what happens. We're going to be changing state uh, back and forth. And this is the way the system was designed years and years ago uh, with folks in lab, lab coats, uh, uh, without smartphones, if you will. So let's start through the basic stuff. So we know, uh, or at least we think we know, right? Um, you know, that hot goes to cold. Now, hot's a opinion. Uh, so let's just say that warm goes to cool. Um, and and we'll, we'll do it like that, okay? Um, so basically, when we drop pressure, we drop what? We drop temperature. There's a pressure-temperature relationship. So this is a TXV, but quite honestly, it's what? It's a pressure dropper. That's what we're trying to do, trying to drop the pressure, because when we drop the pressure, we drop the temperature. So when we drop the pressure and drop the temperature, we're changing state from this liquid back here to saturation. It's going to start out about 75% liquid, 50% liquid, 25% liquid, and I'm just ballparking here. The goal is to be all vapor, superheated vapor by the end here, so we don't hear crunchy noises over here in our compressor, right? So sticking with the theory that warm goes to cool uh, or high pressure goes to low pressure, let's take a look at this, okay? So we've got our air from inside our building, whether it's residential or commercial, and it's going to come across this coil and that as it starts to boil off, it picks up that heat from the air, our load, if you will, and it carries that into the suction line, hence the name superheated vapor. Okay, so again, 75%, 50%, 25%, and then vapor. So we're boiling off as we're going through this saturation. And it's mainly liquid because why? Because liquid transfers heat much better than vapor does. I mean, think about it. If you were outside for 24 hours and it was 60 degrees, you could survive in 60-degree in air, but you couldn't survive in 60-degree water. And it really depend on the length of time, uh, your body mass, really, okay? So we're not really making anything cold. We're removing heat. We're heat movers. That's what we do. The air comes across the coil, removes that heat from the air, and then it gets cold on the other side, okay? So as it picked up this super heat, by the way, this bulb is filled with refrigerant, as we all know. Uh, most of the time, it's the same refrigerant that's inside the system, but not always. And it doesn't interact with the refrigerant that's in the system, right? So what it does is, again, another pressure-temperature relationship. It expands when it gets warmer, higher superheat, pushes push pressure down on the diaphragm here and gives it more juice, allowing more liquid until it gets satisfied, and then it adjusts itself. That's the cool thing about a TX uh, system or TV or EV, uh, whatever you call it. Uh, whatever type of metering device you have, okay? So it picks up that heat. Now, <clears throat> we're going to come down here. It's going to take that gas, this superheated vapor. Notice the line's larger because it's vapor. It expands, right? Hence the name it, expansion valve, right? So we're heading down this suction line here. Now, the superheat here isn't going to be the same superheat as here. If you're talking to the equipment designer, they're going to ask you for superheat here. Okay, if you're, they're doing a troubleshoot, if you're talking to a compressor manufacturer, you, they're going to be asking for your superheat here, uh, typically known as total superheat. Okay, so it comes down here and picks it up. And the first job of this suction gas here, this low uh, superheated, uh, low pressure superheated vapor, is going to be to cool the compressor because 99.9% .9 of the compressors out there are refrigerant cooled, okay? Very few of them anymore are air cooled. You know, I can think of the K body, the Copeland K body, but now the suction gas comes across that motor and it picks up that heat 
And right about where that weld mark is, is when it's divided from the low pressure to the high pressure. It gets up into the scroll set, the fixed scroll at the bottom, and then the, and then, and the or pardon me, the orbiting scroll at the bottom, the fixed scroll on the top. And as it starts to compress that gas, it, those molecules start to move a lot faster. And as they move faster, it raises the heat, raises the pressure, they start to compress them. And it's, a, the, again, there's another pressure temperature relationship, okay? So it, it starts to re, uh, raise the pressure, raise the temperature here. If you've ever touched the top of a scroll compressor, uh, you typically don't do it twice, it's pretty hot. So, and that's the reason for it, okay? Um, we're gonna go into the discharge line and we're raising this pressure here. And as we come up, we come up to the gas, we're heading for the condenser here. And air comes outside the coil at Mrs. Jones' house over here, up through the AC. We're just going to do a typical AC. Uh, and as we go through, it rejects that hot air, right? Now, there is a fan on the top of the condenser, as we all know that. The air conditioning system outside in most residential homes and buildings and what have you, if you have a DX system like this, okay? But we're also counting on the law of physics, okay? The second law of therm thermodynamics, again, hot goes to cold or however you want to word it. High pressure goes to low pressure. We have to have this warmer than outside ambient. Years ago, when we had 10 sear equipment, it was very common before we had smartphones. Uh, we had a lot of rules of thumbs and some of them were good and some weren't so good, you know? Uh, but this one was pretty spot on and almost every time. Uh, I started when eight sear equipment was the new sear, okay? And when we got 10 sear, we thought we were a big deal. <clears throat> so when in 10 sear equipment, for those of you that haven't been in the industry all that long was, you could about, bet your bottom dollar that whatever this condensing temperature was, saturation condem condensing temperature was, it was about 30 degrees higher than outside ambient. So in other words, if it was 80 degrees outside, you were seeing on your high side <clears throat> about 110. Okay. That was your saturation inside the condenser about midpoint. <clears throat> Okay, so we're playing in fit on the, the, the second law of thermodynamics there too. Notice I got this 225 here. Uh, for those of you that seen my videos, I've been saying it for years, many times when I was at Copeland, 225, stay alive. We never want that temperature to be higher than 225 degrees, six inches out on the discharge line. 225, stay alive. Uh, I've had people see me in an airport and holler, 225, stay alive. Uh, it's kind of funny, but... Uh, Anyways, six inches out. And the reason for that, I'll just take a little time here to explain that is, is because uh, folks many years ago, engineers, guys and gals uh, figured out that we lose somewhere, somewhere, uh, the average of 50 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit of temperature from the hottest point of any compressor. So it's not branded. It's not the compressor manufacturer. It's not based on refrigerant. It's really based on oil. So if you take the worst scenario, as 75 degrees out here, and you add that to 225, you get the magical number 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, what the scientists figured out and the mechanical engineers is we start to lose our lubricity. When we lose our lubricity, we start to cause friction in the compressor. And any of you that have sat through my classes through the years know that the number one cause of compressor failure is overheat. And the number one reason for overheat is high compression ratio, which basically is just saying you either have high head pressure or you have low suction pressure or you have the combination of both. OK, so we'll get into that topic on another day. But we're coming down here, we're rejecting as we come through here, we're rejecting that heat, <clears throat> but we're rejecting a lot of heat. What kind of heat are we rejecting? Well, we're rejecting the heat from the load. We're rejecting the superheat. We're rejecting the heat from the motor and we're rejecting the heat of compression. So we got a lot going on there. That's why they refer to it as desuperheating. As it starts to desuperheat down through this coil, right around this area here, it starts to become liquid and stacks up. Subcooled liquid down here at the bottom as it changes state from vapor as it starts to, to remove the heat and rejects it outside, it starts to go back to its normal form because the normal form of the refrigerant is liquid, right? Hence, it goes into the liquid line, a smaller line. We name things for what they do, all of our components, right? 
uh, uh, the, the condensed version then, the liquid line is smaller because it's more condensed. Again, the, the suction line's larger because it's vapor. It expands, it's larger, okay? The condensing coil condenses, that's what it does. The compressor compresses. Uh, the evaporator evaporates, right? We, we don't think about those things we get in the industry because life's moving so fast when you're getting trained or you're in school, right? You don't think about those small things. You're just The, the goal is just to make the air cold. That's when you get happy. You know, when, when the customer's happy, you're happy, right? But we're really, and, and, and we evaporate. And what does that really mean to us, evaporate? Uh, it's just like sweating on your skin. You know, it, I used to take rubbing alcohol in my classroom, and I'd have the, the, the folks, uh, the technicians in the front row, I'd have them rub a little bit on the back of their hand and then blow on it. It felt really cold. Well, rubbing alcohol is no colder than regular water, okay? The reason it feels colder is because of the speed that it evaporates. So when we go outside in the summertime and we have high humidity in the air, we're feeling a lot warmer. You, the old saying, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Well, it is because the air doesn't want our sweat. Okay. That's our cooling mechanism of our body. We've got to release that sweat and it evaporates in the air. So if the who humidity is 80% one day or 85 really high and it's warm outside, you feel much warmer because that air doesn't want your sweat. It's, it's almost fully saturated or getting close, right? But on the next day, if it's 60 degrees percent humidity, you're gonna feel a lot cooler because it's allowing you to ev evaporate your heat inside your body. So uh, just a fun little fact there for you. So back to the liquid line and back to the starting point, Back to our pressure dropper and starts the whole cycle. If we drew an imaginary line here, okay, no matter what state the refrigerant's in, down here at the bottom, that is vapor, okay? Vapor. On this side, on top of the compressor and the metering device, on this side, no matter what state it's in, whether it's vapor or liquid, it's high pressure. This is low pressure at the bottom. High pressure, low pressure. And that's pretty much it for me today. I just want to walk through that. I did use 454B as the refrigerant. I even took the time to put your little gauges here. Now, when you're taking subcooling, by the way, you know, some manufacturers are going to ask that you take the pressure and temperature within six inches of, a, of each other. Copeland usually recommends that. It's not sketch in stone. It's not, if it's not possible, it's not possible. Um, on a residential unit, which I've done many, many and commercial units through my career is, uh, you know, a lot of times these line sets might only be, you know, not, it's not a perfect world, but let's say 35 foot for the sake of not arguing or somewhere thereabouts. Okay. Um, you can take, I like taking it here. And the reason I like taking it here also, um, is because I want to make sure we have a full line of liquid going into our metering device, because if you have any air bubbles or saturation, if you will, and they're not necessarily air, but any kind of saturation and you're not, don't have a full column of liquid, you do have, you have an inefficient system. Okay. But you want to take it here also, but, and typically with a small line set, these should be fairly close. If they're not, we need to figure out why they're not. Maybe a pinch liquid line here. If it's a new installation, somebody hit it with a nail or, or crimped it or something like that, which has happened to me many a times with working with contractors. Um, you just get in a hurry and then somebody bangs your stuff or whatever. Okay. And again, superheat, <clears throat> we're going to take it here for talking. This is making sure that the, your metering device is matching the load and down here, we're going to check it for the total superheat. And that's for the fact that we want to know what our return gas or superheat is going back in our compressor. Because if you have bad information going in, you're going to have bad information going out. Now, back to this 225, 225 degrees. If that's 235 or 245, 255, it doesn't mean we're throwing the compressor out. We need, just like a voltmeter, we need to go before the compressor. Is it high there? Yes, it is. Is it high here? Yes, it is. We might find it's low on charge or something's going on back here, okay? So we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if you will, okay? We're just going down and doing some do, do, doing our doing our work. We're, we're kind of like doctors, but uh, unlike doctors, our patients can't talk to us. So we have to use instruments to take those readings and figure out the problem ourselves. 
But this is the way I like to teach, especially with younger students. I know it's very fundamental, basic for most of you that are probably watching this. But if you didn't know how it worked, uh, hopefully I got, got it close and I didn't muddy the water for you. That's all I got for you today. I hope you have a great day. I'm Don Gillis. I'll see you next time.